place a more fundamental solution. So here's the Governor of the Bank of England saying there needs to be some solution worked out pretty soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. And there will be a special programme looking at the future for the euro. It's called Euro Crisis with Gavin Esler. It's on the BBC News Channel tonight at 8 o'clock. Older people who take a group of drugs used to treat conditions including asthma, depression and epilepsy may have an increased risk of dementia and even death. That's according to new research. Our health correspondent Adam Brimelow reports. A small selection of the many types of anticholinergic drugs that are used for a wide range of conditions. They block the ability to pass on messages between nerve cells. In this study of people over 65, nearly half were taking some form of this medication. The researchers ranked more than 80 of the drugs into categories to score their strength. There were problems for patients on the most potent doses involving two or more drugs. There is an increased risk of um, brain dysfunction and memory loss if you take these drugs for a period. And we've also found that there's an increased risk of mortality associated with taking these particular medications. The researchers looked at more than 13,000 people and found that 20% of patients with the highest score died during the two-year study, compared with 7% of those who were not taking this medication. They advised GPs to consider their findings. Most of the drugs are prescription only, but some are available over the counter. Experts say it's vital that doctors and pharmacists know exactly what medication patients are taking so they can avoid unwittingly bringing them together in combinations which could create a risk. Doctors say they already monitor medication closely and that patients should not be alarmed. I think the first thing is not to worry too much. The second thing is to discuss it with your doctor or the pharmacist. And the third thing is do not stop your medicines without taking advice first. The data used in this study goes back two decades. Doctors say there's now a much better understanding of the risks. Adam Brimelow, BBC News. Well, let's talk to Dr Susan Sorensen, who is Head of Research at the Alzheimer's Society. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us. And don't worry too much was the message there, but clearly there are some very recognisable, commonly used medicines in, in that report. People are going to be worried. Yes, and I understand that. But um, I have to reiterate uh, what Adam Brumelow said just before, that it is important not to panic because some of these medications are given to treat very serious conditions. What is important is, for example, next time a person is going to have a new prescription to take all the medication he or she is taking to the doctor and have it all reviewed as a whole and get the doctor to look at them as a whole person. Part of the problem is that many doctors, particularly specialists, look at only the condition they're treating and may forget that older people may suffer from several conditions and take several types of medicine and they may also buy things over the counter that the doctor doesn't know anything about uh, and as this side effect uh, gets much worse if you're taking several drugs that that has this particular effect then it's important for both pharmacists and doctors to look at the medication as a totality and the person as a whole person. Yes, because obviously the combination of the drugs is, is the problem here, but presumably it is very important that people don't just take themselves off certain drugs without consulting a doctor. No, absolutely. Some of these drugs are very important. And in some ways, we're looking at a success story. We can now treat so many conditions we couldn't treat years ago. Uh, that's why people are so many, on so many more different types of medication. The other side of the problem is that most of these drugs are only trialed on patients with one condition and often on younger patients. People over 65 are very commonly not included in clinical trials. So we don't really have the data of how these drugs work on these people. So it's important to do more research on real life people, older people with several conditions. Do Dr. Sorensen, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Now, at six o'clock this morning, millions of tickets for next year's London Olympics went on sale for people who were left empty-handed after the first round ballot. This time it was first come, first served, and the website struggled under the heavy demand, but it didn't crash. After just three hours, though, it seems the only tickets left in any numbers were for football matches. Joe Wilson reports. Usain Bolt? Well, it seems he's long gone. Most tickets for the big London Olympic events were taken in the opening ballot. And after a few hours of the second round today, most of what remained had apparently gone. What's left? 
You could see weightlifting at the Excel Arena, volleyball at Earl's Court, and of course football in various venues across Britain. But most of today's tickets were snapped up in a rush that overwhelmed the website at times. The Burke family in Nottinghamshire were signed in from 6am. It was frustrating as the site seemed to grind to a halt, but finally processed their application. We were well planned and we'd sorted out what we wanted to go for and what alternatives. And in the end, we just ended up going for anything because the things that we wanted weren't available. So it was a case of just trying to get the application done as quickly as possible to be able to press the submit button. Like so many others, I was unsuccessful in the opening round. Trying to buy tickets this morning, I was soon confronted with a worrying message. This was a system under severe strain. It looks like finally, here we are, it has. I've got a reference number here, and that should mean that when I look in my email account, there will be a message from London 2012 saying my application has been received. Now, that doesn't mean necessarily that I've got the tickets, but at least at 18 minutes past seven, it is progress. Purchases will be confirmed in a day or two, but even those who failed this time are encouraged to persevere. Some tickets are bound to reappear. When people buy tickets 12, six months, 12 months in advance, their plans will change. They'll have tickets they want to sell on. And so there's, it's very likely that, that more tickets will come, become available, even perhaps for those very popular events like the Men's 100 Metre Final. Another million or so tickets will be officially released in the winter once the seating plans have been finalised. Many people do feel let down by the website's problems today, but if nothing else, it shows the deep demand even for minority Olympic sports. And for the organisers who have built the Games, that is an enormous relief. Well, Joe Wilson is at the Olympic site in East London now, so a lot of people have been up very early trying to get hold of these tickets, but as you just said, this isn't quite the end of the road, is it? No, absolutely. I think it will be a, a challenge, Sophie, from now on to get tickets. If we think about the Olympic Park just behind me specifically, which I think is the place where people most associate with the Olympic Games, it appears right now that every event and every sport and every session is actually sold out. So where do you go from here? Football is the obvious one. Remember, that's played in six different locations around Great Britain, including Glasgow and Cardiff. It's my guess that tickets will remain on sale for various football matches, well, effectively right up until kickoff. But what if money is no object for you? You can go to the 2012 website, find a link to their official tour operator. Now, that's a way of getting a ticket as part of a package, maybe including hotel accommodation and travel. But it will cost maybe into the thousands. So, say, Sophie, I guess what we can say right now is that there is a way if you can pay. Joe, thank you very much. The time is coming up to 20 past one, our top story this lunchtime. The convicted killer, Levi Belfield, is given a second life sentence for the murder of the schoolgirl, Millie Dowler, but the jury was discharged this morning before they reached a verdict on a final charge against him. And later in the programme, it is a special day here at Wimbledon. The sun is shining and there are three British players in action. Later in sport, we'll have the latest from Valencia, where Mark Webber was fastest in the first practice session ahead of this weekend's European Grand Prix as Red Bull dominated yet again. Images of violence on the streets of Northern Ireland this week show that sectarian tension is still simmering in some areas. Many Catholics and Protestants lead separate lives. And a new bridge in Londonderry is the latest attempt to bring the two together. Our Ireland correspondent Mark Simpson is on the bridge for us now. Mark. Well, let's be honest, it has not been a good week for community relations here in Northern Ireland. But this shiny new bridge, the first pedestrian bridge in this city, is designed to bring people together. For as long as anyone can remember, it's been a city of two halves with two names. The new Peace Bridge is the latest attempt to bridge the gap. It cost £13 million and it links the mainly Catholic West Bank of the River Foyle with the largely Protestant East Bank. Catholics call the city Derry, most Protestants say Londonderry. But the divisions here run much deeper than words. And it's the same in some other parts of Northern Ireland as the two nights of riots in East Belfast demonstrated this week. But the man charged with keeping the peace in Derry says... The new bridge here shows how much has changed in Northern Ireland. 
I was here in the 1980s as a police officer in this city for six years. It's a fundamentally different place now. It's a place of hope, it's a place of increasing prosperity, and it's a place where the people of the city want peace. But will anyone actually use the bridge? We brought this group of young Catholics to the other side. I've actually never really been over here. Um, I would be afraid to come over here sometimes just because you hear of attacks and stuff, but it has settled down the last couple of years, and I think this bridge will even smooth that over even more. I think it's a great thing for our generation because you, we can always say, I remember when that bridge was built, I remember going across the bridge for the first time. Tony and Rhea Brown live on the mainly Protestant side. They say they'll try to use the bridge. I just love to see it in Dover. And I told my daughter, I'm not able to walk it, put me in a wee wheelie chair and take me over. <laughs> It'll take more than a long, shiny bridge to solve the problem of sectarianism. But after a week in which Northern Ireland's lingering divisions have been exposed, it can only help. Well, as we know, names are very important here, and this bridge already has two names, the Peace Bridge and the Bendy Bridge. Sophie. Well, thank you very much. America has expressed concern over reports that Syria is moving troops near the border with Turkey. The US Secretary of State Hillary Clinton warned President Assad to pull his troops back from the border, describing the situation as very worrisome. Well, our correspondent Jonathan Head is on the Turkey-Syria border. And are you able to establish just how close those troops and tanks are now? Yes, I am, Sophie. In fact, uh, the fields you can see behind me just go for a short while, then behind that Syria, now just up the hill, almost just about by, uh, behind my, the level, level of my head. On that hill, which is probably less than a mile, of, mile from here, we can clearly see Syrian troops. We can see trucks. They've been moving around quite a bit today, moving up to a tower that's behind us. Quite significant numbers of them. And hidden in the trees, there are definitely armed.